Welcome back to our continuing pursuit, again, to develop the mind of Christ, enabled by the word of Christ, grounded in the gospel of Christ. We are continuing our work in chapters 9 through 11, where we ex have been exploring the phrase in Romans 1.16, to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles, with the sub-theme, Did God's Word Fail? So in this lesson, we continue the purpose of Israel's rejection, part two. And then my first point, the position, verses 16 through 18. If the dough offered as the first fruit is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who supports the root, but the root that supports you. All right? Paul's metaphor of the dough and the root teach the same truth, that consecration of the first part consecrates the whole. The dough metaphor is drawn from Numbers 15, 17 through 21. The Lord instructs his people that after they enter the promised land, they are to offer to the Lord a dough offering. It is like the first fruits of their crop. The first dough for baking, uh, which is the first dough for breaking bread. However, Paul gives no hint to what set of circumstances this metaphor applies. However, the answer is in the second parallel metaphor in which the ver in the verse, and we're ta I'm talking about the branches. The branches are the Jews. However, Paul did not clearly identify the root, but I contend that the first dough and the root is the election by God of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promises given to them. That's the root and the first dough, all right? Since God consecrated them, the first dough and the root, both are, are consecrated, and so is the whole lump of dough and the branches, all right? which are the Jew, which is the Jewish people. However, God's consecration does not mean that the patriarchs possess any qualities that earn them spiritual benefits for themselves and their descendants. As both the Old Testament and Paul make clear, the patriarchs and Israel are only a conduit. Their holiness consists in having been set apart by God. Now, the word holy is taken from the Old Testament sacrificial language. The word does not have a sense of being set apart by God for salvation. Catch that. That it usually has in the New Testament. We are sanctified or set apart for salvation in the New Testament. That word doesn't carry over from the old. All right? But the set apart by God in the Old Testament is to be a special vessel in salvation history. Catch that, please. The special, remember, the Old Testament is a shadow. This special vessel relationship between God and Israel is a reason to have hope or a reason for hope for Israel's spiritual renewal. Paul, using the root and branches metaphor, warns Gentile Christians that the protasis, if clause, of a conditional sentence whose apodosis, then clause, contains the prohibition. The if clause has two parts, all right? First, some of the branches 
have been broken off. He says, if some of the branches have been broken off, all right? The branches broken off are unbelieving Jews. Follow the metaphor. Here Paul restates the essential tragedy that inspired his writing of Romans 9 through 11 in the first place. Jews, here it is, Jews, the recipients of God's blessing through their ancestry, have become God's, have because of God's hardening and their own unbelief, have been severed from God's ultimate blessing. They were a special ble- they were a special vessel, but not of, but now they've been separated from God's ultimate blessing. Second, grafting in among the branches that remain or grafted in among the branches that remain are branches that come from what? A wild olive tree. We've been down this road, which are Gentile Christians. Gentiles have no natural relationship to the patriarchs or to the promises. Only by faith alone and God's grace have they become fellow participants with Jewish Christians. Two aspects of this metaphor require further comment, and I'm going to do this. First, is the significance of Paul's choice of the olive tree as a symbol of Israel in the Old Testament and the fact that the olive tree was the most widely cultivated fruit tree in the Mediterranean area. By contrast, a wild olive tree was disgracefully unfruitful. So Paul identifying Gentiles as wild olive tree branches should moderate Gentile pride. Second, Paul's reference to grafting branches from a wild or uncultivated tree into a cultivated one is the reverse of the usual process and practice. And there are those who claim that Paul did not know what arboriculture or didn't understand arboriculture because farmers did not graft unfruitful wild branches into a cultivated tree. Think about that for a second. So, my view, Paul theologizing the Christian faith inspired by the Holy Spirit, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, recognize who, who's doing the inspiration here. God can and has acted contrary to nature to illustrate his grace and power. Think about this. God can, 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 can do anything but fail. Think about that. The then clause contains the prohibition. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. The verb arrogant combines pride and conceit regarding others. The others are who? The natural branches. But Paul does not mean or does not specify that just the branches that have been broken off, which are the unbelieving Jews, or branches that remain Jewish Christians. But now, who is he talking about? He probably is talking about both. The Paul's comparison between the Gentile Christians who stand in God's grace by their faith with Jews who have been cut off because of unbelief shows that he must have unbelieving Jews in mind. Now, that's, that's, but now, we have... The, 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 Gentiles sometimes have problems with, with Jewish believers. That's how we divide ourselves. It's a human, I guess, and I'm going to say it this way. A human nature tainted by sin is interesting. Here we got Gentile Christians boasting over Jews is not the result of anti-Semitism, generally, but of a mistaken interpretation of the course of salvation history. The Holy Spirit identifies in Gentile Christians this mistaken notion because of the unprecedented degree in which the doors of salvation were open to Gentiles after the coming of Christ. They think meant the closing of the same doors to the Jews. 
and that some Gentile believers were apparently convinced that they belonged to a new people of God that had replaced, not complemented, or supplemented Israel. Those Jews who believe, now I'm talking about Gentile Christians, they apparently assume could be part of now their community on what? Their terms. They, they, see, the Holy Spirit is anticipating sinful, the sinful nature in believers. It is to this kind of attitude that the Holy Spirit through Paul responds. He begins, now, so what does he do? He begins with another conditional sentence in which for the sake of argument, he assumes that despite his prohibition, Gentile Christians will still insist on continuing to boast over Jews. In that case, Paul warns, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root that supports you. Gentile Christians who boast over Jews are demonstrating an attitude of disdain for the Jew for their our Jewish heritage. That we got it too, by the way, even though we're not Jews. Yet it is that very heritage upon which the Gentile Christians themselves depend for the for our own spiritual standing. For the root that gives spiritual nourishment to Jewish and Gentile believers alike is the patriarchs and recipients and transmitters of the promise of God. And that root is not only of historical interest, as the present tense Paul uses here indicates, the root, the patri the root of the patriarchs continues to be the source of spiritual nourishment that believers require. Because <laughs> think about it. There is only one root and only one tree. Branches, whether Jewish or Gentile, that do not remain attached to the tree are doomed to wither and die. What did Jesus say over in John 15? I'm the vine. You're the branches. You remain in me and I remain in you. But if you get out of that, What's that? You'll be cut off and wither and die and only be good to be burned. Go back over there and read that. Here again, we see the careful balance of Paul's argument. Physical descent from the patriarchs does not bring salvation, not automatically. Jews are in the same position as Gentiles held under sin's power, and needing to respond to God in faith to be saved. Yet salvation comes only to those who are of Abraham's seed. We covered that in Romans 4. The people of God are one, and that people has both a Jewish root and a continuing Jewish element. All right, I'm at point number two. The perturbation, verses 19 through 21. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. All right? Paul anticipated more misguided, ironic reflection using another hypothetical metaphor. A Jewish, a Gentile Christian who seeks to justify his or her feeling of superiority over the Jews. Branches have been broken off in order that I might be grafted in. Paul responds, now check it out, with a qualified agreement. He does not straightforwardly deny the point that the Gentile Christian has made. Paul, for, call why? Paul has argued the, the hardening of Jews has led to the extension of salvation to the Gentiles. Paul's been arguing that all along. But Paul also argues that this salvation is in turn designed to stimulate Jews to jealousy as a means of their spiritual restoration. God's purposes in cutting off natural branches 
extend far beyond the inclusion of Gentiles. It is the egotism of Gentile Christians who present God's manifold plan as having as having the salvation of themselves as its focus that Paul wishes to expose and, guess what, criticize. Another facet of this egotism of the Gentiles is their sense of pride in having obtained a place in the people of God. This attitude Paul seeks to deflate by reminding us, them, us Gentiles, that it is faith that makes the difference. It is because of their lack of faith that so many Jews have been cut off. And it is through faith that the Gentile Christian has attained a standing within the people of God. What Paul says here to the Gentile Christian echoes what he said earlier to the Jews. In res- now, now think about this. In response to the Jews' tendency to boast in their status and accomplishments, Paul emphasized that the gracious nature of God's dealing with human beings excluded all boasting. It is faith and faith alone characterized by humility and receptivity that is the only way to establish or to maintain a relationship with God. Come on here. So, recognizing that every spiritual benefit comes from or comes as a gift from our gracious God, the Gentile Christian must stop thinking so highly of his or herself and take up an attitude of fear. Now, here's where Paul's going. This basic biblical concept combines reverential respect for God and a healthy concern to continue to live out of the grace of God in our lives. Paul explains why the Gentile Christian should fear. Think about this. If God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. All right? Disobedience and unbelief constitute suppression of God's truth, which is a failure to display an appropriate fear of God, which has led to judgment for many Jews and Gentiles, by the way. And if God so judged Jews who had a natural connection to the tree and its sustaining root, the, 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 the word, the, the, the Torah, he will surely judge those who have been grafted in as alien branches. All right, I'm at point number three, the proviso, verses 22 through 24. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in for those, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into what, into a cultivated olive tree, How much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? All right? Now, in these verses, Paul uses theological language to discuss the implication of two sides of God's grace. One, his love is free and undeserved. Two, his wrath if one refuses his love. In context with the preceding metaphor, one, God's severity, reinforces the note of condemnation found in the not spared. Identifying God's severity on those who have fallen. Come on. Two, God's kindness is shown by grafting into God's people, Gentile Christians, who stand in faith through God's gracious initiative. 
Paul's main purpose is to repeat his warning to Gentiles who may presume on God's goodness. God has given eternal life to all and provided an option as to where to spend it. However, God's goodness is not simply, <clears throat> excuse me, a past act or automatic belief or automatic benefit on which one can rest secure. It is relationship, a relationship in which one must enter. Refusal by the Gentiles will, like the Jews, be cut off. That person will be cut off, severed forever from the people of God and eternally condemned. Let's go back to John 3. Paul uses this same principle of equal treatment positively to offer hope for the eventual spiritual renewal of Jews who can be grafted back in to the olive tree if they do not persist in their lack of faith. Now, in speaking of such a regrafting, Paul again reveals how little he is concerned to stick with the details of actual olive cultivation in his metaphor. It is not the logic of nature that explains this regrafting. But guess what? The love of God who gives life to the dead and calls things that do not exist as if they did. This is God's business. The power of God that is at work in the gospel. That's what Paul is talking about. Paul's stress on God's ability here may seem redundant. But he is addressing the attitude of certain Gentile Christians who might question the appropriateness of God's extending his grace to those who had already been cast off. So, summarizing, Paul again exploits his metaphor to give another reason for God's desire to restore Jews who turn from, who turn in un, from unbelief to belief. Paul utilizes the familiar how much more argument. He reminds Gentile Christians that they who belong to a wild olive tree by nature have been cut off from that tree and grafted into a cultivated olive tree. Now if God can so graft wild branches into a cultivated olive tree that, that do not naturally belong to it, he is certainly able to graft back into his tree those branches who do belong to that tree by nature. The Jews, come on. It is, after all, their own tree. So, here's what's going on. Paul has lingered on Jewish sin. He did linger on it, in chapter 2, to counter Jewish boasting over Gentiles. So he is now, as he, so he now accentuates Jewish advantage to counter Gentile boasting over Jews. We're, we're, we're human beings, we're something. Paul does not mean that it is easier to save a Jew than a Gentile, or that uh, the Jew, by reason of being a Jew, can make any claim on God, for this would give to the Jew an advantage in salvation that Paul has plainly denied, and he's been denying it. Every person, Jew or Gentile, stand under, stands under sin's power and can be saved only by a special act of God's grace. Just like Gentiles, Jews can only be saved if they are grafted by God into the tree. But even when cut off from the parent tree because of unbelief, they retain the stamp of their origin. They belong to that people which God has chosen through which he has manifested himself to the world and to which he remains committed. Their quality as natural branches, however, does not in itself qualify them 
for grafting into the tree. But as branches that trace their origin to a holy root, their regrafting is easier to understand than the grafting of those alien wild olive branches. That's what he's, see where we're going here? But basic to the whole metaphor is the unity of God's people, a unity that crosses both historical and ethnic boundaries. The basic point of the metaphor is that there is only one olive tree whose roots are firmly planted in Old Testament soil and whose branches include both Jews and Gentiles. This olive tree represents the body of Christ, the true people of God. But Paul's metaphor warns us not to view this transition as a transition from one people of God to another. Gentiles who come to Christ become part of that community of salvation founded on God's promises to the patriarchs. All right? There's no second, no different way to do this. Everybody who is saved comes through one funnel, belief in God alone. Salvation comes by faith alone, whether Jew or Gentile. And that is the foundation of, of, of what we're talking about. All right? We are stopping here. Again, if you want to review or research this or any other lesson on YouTube, type in Compassionate Holistic Habitus. The Gospel. We're closing out again. I'm closing my, 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 my signature closeout. The Gospel of Christ is the ground and foundation for the word of Christ that enables the mind of Christ. May God bless and keep you. Amen, amen, and amen.